Good afternoon. Today we'll receive testimony on two bills, S4370, Tribal Forest Protection Act Amendments of 2024, and S4505, Oko, hold, hold on, Okeo Wingay. Did I do that okay? All right, let's do that again. Okeo Wingay, Rio Chama Water Rights Settlement Act of 2024, S4370, Vice Chairman Murkowski's bill would amend the Tribal Forest Protection Act of 2004 by expanding eligibility for tribes to take on certain forest protection and restoration activities on federal public lands from the Forest Service and the BLM. It would allow tribes to use TFPA funding to conduct these activities on their own tribal land and authorize Alaska Native corporations to manage federal public lands and lands they own pursuant to the same authorities. S4505, Senator Heinrich's bill, would resolve the claims of the O.K. Owinge Pueblo uh, water rights in the Rio Chama stream system in New Mexico. The bill establishes an interest-bearing trust fund to implement the negotiated settlement between the Pueblo and the United States and other interested parties. S4505 is one of several Indian water rights settlement bills introduced and referred to the committee over the last two weeks. Recognizing that our committee plays a key role in enacting such settlements, each deserves our keen uh, consideration and due diligence. And before I turn to the vice chair for her opening statement, I'd like to extend my welcome and thanks to our witnesses for joining us today. And I look forward to your testimony and our discussion. Vice Chair Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to focus my comments this afternoon on S4370. This is the Tribal Forest Protection Act Amendments of 2024. This would modify and improve the Tribal Forest Protection Act of 2004 to promote greater indigenous stewardship of federal and Indian forest lands and rangelands. I've introduced this because tribal lands and resources have become increasingly vulnerable to wildfire, to insect infestation, other natural hazards that originate on federal lands. So our legislation is intended to put tribes in the lead by strengthening the role of native communities in federal land management so that they can reduce threats to their own uh, and resources. I believe this measure is, is timely, it's well warranted, and thanks to the 2018 Farm Bill, projects proposed under the TFPA may be carried out through uh, ISDIA funding agreement. We're seeing more interest in this underutilized tool. A TFPA uh, empowers tribes to harness indigenous knowledge and Western science when conducting forest management projects, which of course are proven to reduce wildfire severity and restore forest ecosystems. But in the 20 years since TFPA was first enacted, wildfires are burning faster, hotter, uh, and longer. And we're seeing, um, and it's compounded by chronic mismanagement of forest lands by the federal government. According to the Intertribal Timber Council, nearly half a million acres of tribal lands are now consumed by fire each year. Too often these fires ignite on remote federal lands and spread to tribal lands, endangering native people, property, infrastructure, and cultural resources. TFPA currently, does not currently allow tribes to conduct forest management activities on federal land unless those lands are immediately adjacent to Indian lands. And that limitation effectively blocks tribes from managing larger forest landscapes that they've cared for and been physically and spiritually connected to for generations. Obviously, fire doesn't follow borders drawn on a map or any other strictures of law, so my bill would give tribes the flexibility to plan and implement forest health and management projects on federal lands beyond those lands immediately adjacent to their reservation boundary. The legislation also includes a critical fix to TFPA, which currently omits lands owned by Alaska Native Village and Regional Corps. Without this fix, Alaska's ANCs, which own more than 44 million acres of land, are practically excluded from participation under the TFPA statute. It's just not acceptable. The forested lands owned by ANCs are in every aspect Indian forest land. We have a unique legal framework in Alaska that governors, governs Alaska Native communities, the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, but we should not be disadvantaged by it. So if we enact this, S4370 would allow Native communities in Alaska to apply their indigenous knowledge and skills to fo federal forest land and to the 44 million acres of ANCSA lands that are currently off limits to tribal management under TFPA. So I'm looking forward to the testimony from our witnesses, including the Department of Interior, which has offered very positive words and outright support for it. And I'm also looking forward to welcome, welcoming my friend, Ben Malott, who has traveled uh, to be here from Alaska. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Murkowski. We will now turn to the witnesses. 
We are happy to have Tracy Kennard Goodluck, the Senior Advisor to the Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs at the Department of Interior. Mr. John Crockett, Associate Deputy Chief for State, Private, and Tribal Forestry at the Department of Agriculture. And Senator Heinrich, if you'd like to introduce um, one of our witnesses and uh, make any opening statement, you'd be welcome to do so. Thank you, uh, Chairman Schatz and Vice Chair uh, Murkowski for holding this hearing on the Okeawinge Rio Chama Water Rights Settlement Act. Uh, I also want to express um, my uh, enthusiasm for the Vice Chair's Veterinary Services Bill and look forward to working with you on that. I'm pleased today to introduce Larry Phillips, Jr., Governor of Okeawinge Pueblo, who is here to provide testimony today. Governor Phillips was born and raised in Okeawinge and has served his Pueblo in a variety of roles over the last three decades. Uh, he has led the Pueblo's effort in advancing their water settlement since 2012 when he became the director of Okeawinge's Natural Resource Division. He has made this settlement a top priority since his term as governor began in 2022, and I look forward to continuing our partnership to get this water settlement over the finish line. Uh, I also want to say hello to Thora Padilla from Mescalero Apache, who is going to be joining you virtually today on the, uh, on the forestry bill. Uh, she knows her stuff, and she is all too familiar with uh, recent wildfires like the Salt Fire. Uh, the Okeawinge uh, Rio Chama Water Rights Settlement Act would settle the water rights of Okeawinge Pueblo in the Rio Chama stream system and provide the resources necessary to restore the bosque or riparian forest on the Pueblo's land. This legislation would implement the settlement agreement that has been carefully negotiated between Okeawinge, the state of New Mexico, neighboring water users, and the United States. I want to thank all of the parties for their tireless work in reaching a settlement agreement for this basin. For more than a century, the United States has failed to protect the water rights of Okeawinge and other tribes. As a result, the Pueblo suffered from lack of water for families, for farms, for businesses, and for their bosque. It's hard to bring jobs and economic development to any community if you can't have reliable, guaranteed water. Uh, and Pueblo members' traditional ways of life have suffered as the bosque has dried and native plants, fish, and wildlife have declined. The failure of the United States to ensure that Okeawinge could use the water that they have always owned has reverberated through generations. It has a direct impact on the well-being of Pueblo members today, and it is time we make this right. This legislation would fully settle the Okeawinge's claim to the Rio Chama Basin. It would provide resources for the Pueblo to restore the Rio Chama Bosque, a critical ecosystem that not only protects the Rio Chama, but also provides traditional food and medicinal resources. The settlement will provide critically needed funding for water infrastructure to develop and distribute new water to Pueblo homes and businesses. It will make it possible for Okeawinge to finally use the water that they have owned for more than a century. In recent decades, Congress, working through this very committee, has made real progress on making tribes whole for the water that has always been theirs. We have an opportunity to take yet another step towards, uh, forward on that by approving this settlement. Thank you to the committee and all your members for your consideration today and I would yield back the remainder of my time, Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Heinrich. Uh, Senator Lujan, would you like to introduce another New Mexico uh, witness? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Vice Chairman Murkowski as well for holding this important legislative hearing today. Uh, before I introduce President Padilla, I also want to recognize um, an incredible leader from New Mexico and Governor Larry Phillips, to you, to your team for being here today. And as you shared with us, Governor, on behalf of all of the people from Okeawinga and from the communities as well, um, our elders, our ancestors, it's an honor to have you before us today. It's good to see you, sir. Now, today, Mr. Chairman, I have the honor of introducing President Thora Padilla of the Mescalero Apache as a witness for today's hearing. She served as president since January 12, 2024. Now, President Padilla previously worked for the tribe as director for the Division of Resource Management and Protection, a program she helped establish and develop. She also previously worked as the Bureau of Indian Affairs Mescalero Agency as a timber sale forester for eight years. 
President Padilla graduated from New Mexico State University in 1985 with a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture and a major in Horticulture and minors in Botany and Fine Art. In her short time as president, President Padilla has already demonstrated her leadership and dedication to the Mescalero Apache and the state of New Mexico. Last month, fires devastated areas of southeastern New Mexico, only to be followed by flood. These wildfires upended the lives of far too many New Mexicans, destroying thousands of homes and businesses and disrupting livelihoods. During these turbulent times in our communities, President Padilla was a leader in the Mescalero, Apache, Rio Doso, and Roswell communities. I am proud to work with her back home, and I am proud to have her here in Washington to make things better for our tribal communities, for our state, and for our country. I look forward to her testimony. I yield back. Vice Chair Murkowski, would you like to introduce your Alaska witness? I would be honored to do so. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be able to welcome back to the committee my friend, uh, Mr. Ben Malott. Ben is the newly announced president-elect for the Alaska Federation of Natives, AFN. Um, this committee knows the good workings of AFN over the years, the oldest and largest statewide native membership organization in our state. Um, ben is, has dedicated his life, really dedicated his life to the interests of Alaska and to uh, Alaska Natives. Um, he's very familiar with these, with these issues that are in front of us. He has worked in this building before, and uh, I've had the opportunity to, to work side by side with him before he returned back to the state. But, uh, it's always good to see you, but I am I'm truly honored today that you are here to provide uh, input to the committee, uh, your expertise, but really delighted that you're going to be assuming this very significant role at AFN. So welcome back. Well, it's time for your uh, full written testimony. I want to remind our witnesses that your full excuse me, that your full written testimony will be made part of the official hearing record and um, please keep your statements uh, to no more than five minutes so that we have time for questions. And uh, Ms. Goodluck, uh, please proceed. Thank you. Sokoli, good afternoon, Chairman Schatz, Vice Chairman Murkowski, and members of the committee. My name is Tracy Kennard Goodluck. I'm a member of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin, and I'm also Muskogee Creek of Flop Flaco Tribal Town. I serve as Senior Advisor to the Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs at the Department of the Interior. Thank you for the opportunity to present the Department's views on S4505 and S4370. These bills highlight the United States' trust obligation to protect the continued existence of Indian tribes. This means ensuring that each tribe has a protected homelands where its citizens can maintain their tribal existence and way of life. The department is also committed to improving the stewardship of our nation's federal forest lands and water by strengthening the role of tribal communities in federal land management honoring tribal sovereignty, and supporting the priorities of tribal nations. With respect to tribal forestry, Congress declared in the Nas National Indian Forest Resource Management Act that the United States has a trust responsibility toward Indian forest lands. The Tribal Forest Protection Act allows for tribes to manage federal forest and rangelands to mitigate risks to tribal forest land resources. The TFPA and proposed amendments here are also in line with the Joint Secretary's order on co-management. The department supports S4370 as it aligns with important administration priorities. S4370 would amend the TFPA to include ANCSA lands in the definition of tribal forest and range lands. S4370 would also remove the requirement that TPF, TFPA activities occur on land bordering or adjacent to tribal lands and extend application of TFPA to activities occurring on Indian forest or rangeland. These changes would provide parity to Alaska Natives and allow for cross-jurisdictional work to protect the health of both federal and tribal lands. We would like to work with the sponsor and committee to clarify the role of the BIA with the proposed expansion of TFPA projects on tribal lands. The department is also pleased to support S4505. S4505 would approve and provide authorizations to carry out the settlement of all water rights claims of the Okeawinge in the Rio Chama River Basin. 
Since time immemorial, Oke Wenge has made use of the water in the Rio Chama Basin. However, Rio Chama water supply available to Oke Wenge has been reduced over time by diversions by neighboring non-Indian water users. A portion of Oke Wenge's lands lie within the bosque, or forested habitat, along the Rio Chama and Rio Grande, which is the great historical and cultural significance to Oke Wenge people. The bosque areas within Oke Wenge's lands were altered as a result of the flood control and irrigation projects constructed by the United States in the mid-1900s. Recent effects of climate change are exacerbating these effects and surface water supplies are dwindling. Oke Wenge seeks funding as part of the proposed settlement to remedy the damages to its lands within these bosque areas. They also plan to develop Oke Wenge's water resources for various uses including domestic and municipal purposes for current and future populations. S4505 is designed to meet O.K. Wenge's needs for water by providing a trust fund that will allow O.K. Wenge to make decisions regarding how, when, and where to develop those projects. And S4505 would also allow O.K. Wenge to restore and protect its culturally important bosque lands. This approach is consistent with tribal sovereignty and self-determination. It is also consistent with our trust responsibilities and will help to ensure that O.K. Wenge can maintain its way of life. Thank you for the opportunity to provide the department's views on these bills, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Mr. Crockett, please proceed. Uh, Good afternoon, Chair, Chair Schatz, Vice Chair Mikowski, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to share the Forest Service perspective on S4370, the Tribal Forest Protection Act amendments of 2024. My name is John Crockett, and I've been a career Forest Service employee for more than 26 years, and I currently serve as the Deputy Chief for State, Private, and Tribal Forestry. And in this role, I oversee the agency's work to reach across boundaries of the nation's forest by providing financial, technical assistance to states, tribes, communities, and private landowners. The Forest Service works to strengthen the nation-to-nation -nation relationship to, with tribes, fulfill our trust responsibility, honor treaty rights, and enhance tribal co-stewardship of our nation's forests and grasslands is fundamental to our mission. Recent accomplishment demonstrates our growth in tribal collaboration. Last February, we released a tribal action plan detailing actions that the Forest Service would take to meet our general trust, resp trust responsibilities, honor treaty rights, and support tribal self-determination. Our first action, one of our first action was to add the word tribal to the name of our deputy area that I lead. It is now state, private, and tribal forestry to recognize the ongoing commitment of our work with tribes. In fiscal year 23, we executed more than 120 co-stewardship agreement with tribes invest in more than $68 million. With the funding from the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the Inflation Reduction Act, and our regular appropriation, our uh, efforts have increased ongoing uh, projects with tribes. Since, 23, since, 2020, since fiscal year 23, we have provided more than $130 million to benefit tri uh, tribes through programs like our Urban and Community War Forestry Program, Wood Innovations, Community Wildfire Defense Grant, and our landscape scale restoration program. The Tribal Forest Protection Act of 2004 provides the Forest Service with the authority to enter into agreements with contracts, enter into agreements or contracts with tribes to carry out projects on the national forest system that protect the bordering or adjacent tribal lands. This authority has been key enabling our collaboration with tribes. The bill under discussion today S4370 shares the goals similar to those laid out in Joint Secretarial Order 3403, fulfilling the trust re responsibility to Indian tribes for the stewardship of the federal lands and water. S4370 would amend the Tribal Forest Protection Act to expand the definition of Indian forests and rangelands to include lands held by Alaska Native corporations, enabling four ANCs with lands proximate to the Tongass and Chugash Nat National Forest to conduct work through TFPA. The Forest Service supports the intent of, in, of this adi addition, which it would amplify the agency's ongoing collaboration with tribes, such as our agreement between the Tongass, Tongass National Forest and the Tinkin and Haida, Tlingit and Haida tribes that formalized our co-stewardship uh, agreement with the Mendenhall 
Glacier National Rec or Recreation Area. Second, S4370 would strike the requirement that Indian lands border or be adjacent to Forest Service or Bureau of Land Management lands. Instead, requiring lands that have a special geographical, historical, or cultural significance to tribes. We agree that the removal of the bordering adjacency requirement is necessary to expand uh, tribal participation and would like to work with the committee and the bill sponsors to discuss the criteria for making this happen. Third, S4370 would expand the program eligibility to allow for work on Indian forest rangelands. The Forest Service would like to work with the committee to discuss the legal and administrative impacts of changing TFPA scope in this way, including, such, including how such changes may benefit from clarifying the role of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Forest Service, and the Bureau of Land Management regarding the work on tribal lands other than those that are the Alaska Native Corporation lands. In closing, we support the committee's goal to expand TFPA, broaden the Forest Service authorities to work, and broaden the Forest Service authorities to work with tribes. We look forward to continuing to work with the committee on the adaptations to TFPA, as well as other opportunities to advance co-stewardship and foster, foster stronger tribal relations. Chair Schatz, Vice Chair Mikowski, and members of the committee, this concludes my statement, and I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you, Mr. Crockett. Governor Phillips, uh, welcome. Hello. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Schatz, Vice Chair Murkowski, and honorable members of the committee. I am Larry Phillips, Jr., Governor of Okiwinge. Here with you today is Eldest Councilman Anthony Makino to show the support of the entire council for this settlement. I would like also to acknowledge the incredible support of our two senators, Senator Lujan and Senator Heinrich. I would not be here today to discuss our settlement without their hard work and efforts on behalf of the Pueblo. Thank you for inviting us to this hearing. I have submitted written testimony for the record on behalf of Okiwinge. I ask for Congress to authorize S4505. My statements today will highlight several points of that testimony. I would like to talk about our bosque and the water and their importance to Okiwinge. Two things of the bosque and the waters that protect and preserve our bosque and our lands are the sense, very essence of what it is to be Okiwinge. In our table language word, Pohana, which means a river of prosperous lands, is a living forest amongst floodplains of our river. In our ceremonies, we cover ourselves and immerse ourselves with the lands and the waters of the bosque to celebrate and give thanks of our emergence from Mother Earth. Our people have been deprived of this ceremony for 75 years because of the actions of the United States. The bosque was taken to us from us by two separate actions of the United States. In 1955, the Bureau of Reclamation and Army Corps of Engineers channelized the Rio Grande in an effort to move water away from our section of the river to benefit junior water users further downstream. Authorization in 1956 of the construction of Abiquiu Dam changed the flows of the Rio Chama. Both of these actions have resulted in a devastating effect to our bosque and our waters necessary for a proper functioning river. We enter into the settlement negotiation to preserve and restore our water resources and the bosque. This is the first tribal water settlement that I am aware of that settles a claim by an Indian tribe that the United States confiscated tribal lands and water in a river channelization project, as I have mentioned. The United States bulldozed our rivers. It largely destroyed our rivers and bosque. This needs to be fixed. This settlement gives us the tools for that. We seek congressional approval and funding for a comprehensive water rights settlement, a settlement that will last for all time. This settlement encompasses more than O.K. Wing's water rights. It is a regional agreement with regional benefits. O.K. Wing, the state of New Mexico, city of Espanola, and many small farmers in the Rio Chama Basin together crafted this agreement. The settlement improves water reliability to all water users in the Rio Chama Basin. In exchange for these benefits, we will give up time and memorial priority to facilitate an equitable sharing of our waters during dry years. 
This settlement will increase supplies. We will work with our neighbors for additional water sources to store in available existing reservoirs. The settlement will provide us use of efficiency by authorizing the funding of delivery infrastructure that will provide economic benefits in the forms of new jobs. We seek $740 million in federal funds to implement this agreement. New Mexico has committed to a local cost share of $131 million. Okiunga will use the federal funds for many purposes related to this settlement. These could include, for example, new groundwater wells, water treatment facility, irrigation ditch improvements to conserve water, water delivery facilities for both farm and as a backup to serve the river and its adjacent vegetations. Backup. We understand that this settlement is a fund base and that Okewunge will not be able to return for additional funding. We have under, if we underestimate the cost of this project we build, we accept that risk. This concludes my written <clears throat> oral testament. Thank you. I'm ready for questions. Thank you very much, Governor. Uh, now we'll welcome virtually uh, President Padilla for her testimony. Good afternoon, Chairman Schatz, Vice Chair Murkowski, and members of the committee and a special hello to Senator Lujan and Senator Heinrich. My name is Thora Padilla, and I'm honored to serve as president of the Mescalero Apache Tribe. Thank you for this opportunity to testify about S-4370, proposed amendments to the Tribal Forest Protection Act. For Mescalero Apache people, forestry is a part of, a way, a part of our way of life. The forest protects our watershed and provides food and shelter to our people. We've played a role in setting national tribal forestry policies for decades. Mescalero was among the first tribes to extend support for the Tribal Forest Protection Act of 2004 and one of the first to engage in a stewardship contract under the TFPA. Treatments conducted under the 16 Spring Stewardship Contract as well as field treatments conducted on tribal lands at Eagle Creek were key to limiting damage to our reservation and the village of Riadosa from the Little Bear Fire of 2012. The TFPA has proven itself for 20 years now, and it's time to expand the reach of projects and tribal participation in this program. For this reason, the Mescalero Apache Tribe extends our full support for S-4370. The bill eliminates the requirement that federal land must border or be adjacent to Indian land. Forest fires, Disease and insect infestation do not respect boundaries. Removing this barrier will permit tribes to conduct landscape scale management projects throughout federal lands where the tribe has historic or cultural connections to the land. The Lincoln National Forest and other nearby federal lands are part of the Mescalero Apache tribe's ancestral homelands. S-4370 holds potential to give the Mescalero Apache tribe a greater voice in the development of forest management strategies that will protect our reservation, our investments in the forest, and our nearby communities. S-4370 also expands TFBA projects to include treatments on Indian lands, which will help offset the significant and long-standing funding shortfalls for tribal forest management. As the latest FMAT report shows, tribal forestry programs we receive one-third to one-tenth of the federal funding delivered to our state and federal counterparts. And finally, the bill adds a funding protection provision to the TFPA which will further improve implementation and help the act reach its true potential. In addition to the improvements proposed in S-4370, we asked the committee to expand on the 2018 Farm Bill's TFPA 638 forestry program. Mescalero testified before this committee in April of 2018 in support of this program. However, last summer, when I reached out to work with the Lincoln National Forest on a 638 forestry contract, I was told that the project did not meet the TFPA requirements and even if it did, there was no funding to support the proposed 638 contract. 
To address these barriers, we urge the committee to support existing proposals, proposals included in both the House and Senate Farm Bills to remove the demonstration designation from this program and make it permanent. We also ask the committee to address other needed improvements to the TFPA 638 forestry program. We ask that you add a funding mechanism to the program that will also cover contract support costs. These additional improvements to the TFPA will enable tribes to consistently enter into contracts and compacts with the Forest Service and BLM. Once this takes place, tribes and tribal priorities will become part of the agency decision-making process and will have positive impacts on the exercise of tribal treaty rights, protection of na native sacred places, and protection of tribal investments on federal lands. In closing, I want to again thank you for this opportunity to testify today in support of S-4370 and its proposed changes to the Tribal Forest Protection Act that will help the law reach its full potential. I am now prepared to answer any questions that the committee may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. President Malat, please proceed with your testimony. Thank you and good afternoon, Chairman Schatz, uh, Chairman Murkowski, and members of the committee. My name is Ben Malat. I had the honor of serving as the Vice President of Criminal Affairs and also as the President-elect of AFN. AFN today is the largest, state, largest statewide native organization in Alaska. Our membership includes 177 Alaska Native tribes, 154 Native village corporations, nine of our 12 regional corporations, and nine of our 12 regional tribal consortiums. I'm here to talk about in support of Senate Bill 4370, the Tribal Forest Protection Act, and I want to thank Sam Murkowski for her leadership in, um, on this bill. The importance of forest management for Alaska Native communities cannot be overstated. Our forests play a critical role role in lives of our native communities, providing a source of subsistence and cultural practices, and provide economic opportunities in our communities, challenged by remoteness and high cost of our communities. Effective forest management is essential to preserve native forest lands for future generations. The Tribal Forest Protection Act, or TFPA, is an important tool that allows native communities to participate in the stewardship of federal forest lands, and also adjacent to native lands but it has faced several challenges that limit its, that limit its work in, for our communities. The original TFPA, while well intended, did not fully account for land ownership of, of our Alaska Native communities. As Senator Kelsey mentioned, AIMSCA transferred transfer over 44 million acres to Alaska Native corporations and their communities. The inclusion of agencies was left out of the original TFPA. This exclusion really limits Alaska Native communities and our landowners to fully engaging in the stewardship of our management, especially cross, cross management boundaries. As you all know, wildflower, wildflower flowers and fires um, and, and other natural disturbances don't care about boundaries. That's why we need to, to remove the obstacles that allow us and our communities to work across these boundaries to preserve our forest. Unfortunately, in Alaska, the definition in the TPA limits this ability. As mentioned, the TVPA, as enacted, undermines our ability, even in the state's, actually, in, in, even the nation's largest forest, the Tungus, to protect the management of forest lands, wildflower, wildfire threats, pests and, uh, pests and other forest issues um, has been a challenge. Over two million acres of forest land in Alaska has been affected by a spruce bark, spruce beetle outbreak. U.S. Forest Service recommends range management to help reduce this damage from forest fires. Currently, the TFPA does not allow ANCs to engage with the Forest Service on these issues or also with the BLM. AFN supports Senate Bill 4370 um, because of this growing risk of, of wildfires and other invasive pests um, 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 in our forest. As I mentioned, the Tungus National Forest is a temperate rainforest. It's a rainforest. I grew up in Juneau. We are getting more dry weather and more unusual weather. The ability for our ANCs and our tribes to manage our lands is critical, especially going forward. Alaska Native Corporations, such as Alaska Corporation, maintain civil cultural programs, and the crews are well equipped to assist in this, in, in, in this process and also nearby federal lands. As mentioned, this bill would enable our ANCs, like Alaska, to hire more forest partnership crews in our communities to manage our own forests alongside our federal partners. There's also a state a closer working relationship with, with the Forest Service and BLM. And as such, AFN supports Senate Bill 3470 forest definition 
of AMC's enforced rangeland and, range, um, and, and enforced lands. Um, the bill also allows for non-adjacent land use as well. As you know, in Alaska, Ainska is kind of a, we have, we have patches land kind of throughout. And as I mentioned, wildfires don't always start next to our lands. So if they teach for us to work with Forest Service to protect our lands, um, even though they're not be far away, is, cru is crucial for the management of our, of, of our forest. I also want to mention, we have time, Senate Bill 4370 also aligns with Joint Sector Order 3403 on putting the trust responsibilities on Indian tribes um, as outlined by USDA and DOI. In closing, 4370 is a much needed update to the TFPA and addresses unique challenges of Native communities through partnerships with the federal government. It provides tools and resources necessary for effective forest management that will benefit our Native communities. And on behalf of AFN, I urge this committee and to advance this legislation um, to protect our native forests. Gunakshree Shanawa Anabasi. Thank you very much for all of your testimony. Uh, I'll start with Ms. Goodluck. Uh, how does DOI currently manage Indian forest or rangelands under TFPA? So as currently enacted, um, BLM does not have the authority to manage Indian forest lands or rangelands, and that would change with uh, the amendments. The S4370 amendments would then open up tribal lands, uh, tribal trust lands for BLM to be able to um, either manage co-jointly with um, their lands and tribal lands, or sometimes there might be, might be a situation where it would just be tribal lands. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Crockett, what impacts would expanding TFPA lands to include any federal lands with special geographic, historical, or cultural significance to a tribe have on existing BLM practices? Thank you for the question, Chair Schatz. Um, so the removal of the, border, uh, the, um, the adjacency requirement would enable more tribes to have access to, to TFPA projects. We think that's a, a benefit for sure. Um, so tribes that don't have uh, access to lands would be able to um, have more, uh, more tribal input. We support the intent to enable uh, tribes to do more, more work with uh, the new language around the special cultural and uh, geographic uh, responsibilities. We would like to discuss the criteria on what it would take to get to success uh, when it comes to the authority that the BLM or the BIA has for the jurisdic jurisdiction over uh, uh, tribal, tribal authorities, and then clarify those roles. What do you mean by that? So as it, as it stands now, um, the BIA has jurisdiction authority over uh, tribal trust lands. And so, um, give me just a second. Uh, so as it stands now, BIA has the, uh, the authority over tribal trust lands, and we would want to uh, work with BIA uh, and not overstep our bounds over jurisdictional authorities with it. Is this something that you guys need to work at? Like, let's assume we enact this. Uh, do we have to clarify this in statutory language, or is this something that you think agency to agency can be worked out? Uh, probably agency to agency uh, on the, uh, the special geographic and historical cultural, cu cultural significance. Sorry, my words aren't good. Oh, I got it. You're doing fine. Um, so, uh, but, but let's maybe be in touch as this piece of legislation moves because if you have a framework, it's probably smart for us to at least clarify legislative intent, if not in the plain language of the text, then, you know, through our report or, or any other way to indicate what we have in mind. But I would, I would sure hate for us to pass this and then you're kind of stuck in a negotiation or a kind of wrangling situation. So the more of this we can clarify in statute, uh, the better. Yeah, let me, let me add one piece. I think the important role of, as we engage with tribes, consultation would be an, an important piece because what we don't wanna have is have the Forest Service be the arbiter if we're, between tribes that, uh, multiple tribes that have a claim to the uh, geographic uh, uh, authorities. And then, so we'd like to work that out through consultation with tribes. Yeah, and you don't want to purchase that problem for, for your own agency, I, I understand. Um, thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Murkowski. So, Mr. Chairman, thank you for that. And I want to uh, do a follow-up here, Mr. Crockett, because um, I think as I listen to our witness from from the Department of Interior, uh, I hear I hear pretty strong 
support uh, for uh, S4370. Um, it clearly, you clearly state, Ms. Goodluck, that, that, you, uh, that DOI supports the bill, but it's not very clear um, what the USDA Forest Service position is on it. And, and quite honestly, I'm really disappointed in, in being here today. Uh, we've had so many years of discussion. I have my staff, um, uh, tribal ANC leaders in, in, uh, across the state, and and you know, we talk about co-management of federal forest land. So I, I too want to make sure that we're not setting something up here where we have divergent views or, or opinions as to how this is all going to work. Um, uh, uh, I want to I want to ask you a couple questions um, and point out what I think is is first of all just plain old factual error in your testimony. You, you, you go on to say that Forest Service only has a presence in southeast Alaska and therefore the TFPA issues are confined to the Tongas, but you and I both know that that's not accurate. Um, we've got two national forests in, in the state of Alaska. The Chugach is located in south central, spans 5.4 million acres, neighbors the Chugach and the Cook Inlet Regional Corporation. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty certain you agree with that and that was just an oversight, so it's not it's not that the Forest Service only has a presence in Southeast Alaska. That is accurate. I'm yeah. not sure how, how that got misconstrued, okay. but Just yes. Correct in the geography here. Right. To, more, to more important things, and this is, um, uh, we want to talk about the change to the definition of Indian forest or rangeland, again, to include uh, land held by an ANC. This is important because it does provide that clarity that the TFPA can be used by ANCs, which we've all acknowledged controls over 44 million acres of land in Alaska. So I, I just want to make clear that these forest lands owned by ANCs are, in every respect, Indian forest lands, and, and want to know whether USDA agrees with that. Yeah, so let me, let me help clear up any uncertainty between either my written testimony or my oral statement. Okay. The Forest Service supports ANCs uh, having access to the Tribal Forest Protection Act. Okay. Clear statement. Okay. Um, we also support um, uh, removing the, the adjacency requirement. Well, I'm going to get to adjacency in just one sec here. Let me, let me ask one more question on that, then, on, on ANCs. Does USDA Forest Service support including ANCs and ANCSA lands specifically um, in the definition of ANCSA lands so that the ANCs can use TFPA to do the forest management work both on federal lands and on their own ANCSA lands? Yes. Okay. Great. So let me then ask about, because this is, this is where, to the chairman's point here, um, I want to make sure that we don't have any ambiguity. Our bill removes the requirement that projects occur on federal lands bordering or adjacent to tribal lands. Or excuse me, uh, yeah. So what, what your testimony um, suggests to me, and this is where I'd like your clarification, it suggests to me that you want to replace adjacency or bordering with what you're calling reasonable proximity. So I want to ask if that is a correct assumption, because where I'm trying to go with this is to remove ambiguity pertaining to proximity and recognize that you've got resources and values on federal land that the tribes want to manage. So I, I think Interior gets it on this. So. The question, Mr. Crockett, is whether or not USDA Forest Service supports removing the border and adjacency requirement for TFPA projects on federal lands. We, we support removing it okay. and replacing it with special geographic, cultural, okay. or historic significance. Okay. And then we'd want to work with the committee on the cr criteria to get to success with that. And, and again, criteria to get to success, I don't want you to, uh, Forest Service to have different criteria than, than Interior, because it sounds to me, and maybe I, I shouldn't assume this, but uh, Ms. Kennard, good luck. D are you guys okay with, with where, uh, where the language is now in the bill? Does that give you the, uh, uh, the, the uh, process or the, um, uh, the necessary information that you need to, to operate, or do you need additional criteria? 
I don't know if criteria is the right word. I think we're comfortable with where the, the amendment lies right now. I think when I said in my testimony about clarifying the BIA's role is that BIA currently manages trust lands right. and then this would allow BLM and USDA. So I think that this, as uh, Chairman Schatz mentioned, this is a conversation that can be interagency that we can have. And if we wanted to clarify intent, I think I'm happy to have our um, team help arrange a conversation with your staff and, and other committee members to clarify the intent. But I think we are comfortable with the language as is now. Well, what I, what I did hear you say, Mr. Crockett, is that Forest Service does support removing the bordering or adjacency requirement for the TFPA projects on federal lands. You said yes to yes, that. Yes, that's correct. So um, I think that's important to get on the record. So uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm out of time. I'm going to want to come back and ask Mr. Malat a question after uh, our colleagues here have gone. Senator Lujan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Look, I, I know everyone listening today um, that, that's paying attention to this important hearing. Uh, there should be no question of the broad support that Vice Chair Murkowski has on this legislation. Um, and I very much appreciate her questioning to get these details correct and the chairman. Uh, we want to get there. So I certainly hope that everyone that's involved works to do that and works to do that in a timely fashion so that this legislation can be be ready to be sent, passed through the House, and get to the President um, for signature as well because of all the challenges that exist in our communities. So uh, I want to thank the Vice Chair uh, again for this. Uh, Governor Phillips, thank you again um, for being here. And I very much appreciate in your testimony your acknowledgement of uh, those that came before us. Um, the decades that you've spent on this important issue but the wisdom that we've all benefited from as well, from those that came before us. Um, I've been very proud to work with you, with the council, um, with Senator Martin Heinrich to support and advance this legislation. And I want to thank my colleagues as well and the chairman and the vice chair for noticing this uh, today as well. Now, Governor, would you share with us what a bosque is and why restoration of the bosque is vital to the Pueblo. Thank you, uh, Senator, Chairman and Vice Chair and committee members. Uh, bosque is a term that's used for a riparian area. For Okiwinge, it's Buena, which is the prosperous life. It's the connection in which the Pueblo is united with the river and it's overbanking. There's a lot of um, activities and cultural activities that are connected. And what has happened with our bosque is that the river's bed, as it was bulldozed and managed now by a dam, has driven a lot of those um, species and those de deities that are in there that we celebrate and we often carry into our ceremonies. That is what it is. It's a connection to our actual lives as water is what we are made of and our relationship to Mother Earth, that connectivity that we often go to to um, celebrate and live individual lives and become um, people of our culture, that's what Bosque means to us. I appreciate that very much, Governor. And what's clear to me is that there's provisions included in this legislation that support the restoration of the Rio Chama and the Bosque, which I appreciate and I applaud. Ms. Goodluck, thank you for coming today as well. In your testimony, you state that, quote, the bosque areas within Okiawinga's lands were altered as a result of flood control and irrigation projects constructed by the United States, end quote. Ms. Goodluck, have, let me change that. As you heard in the testimony from Governor Phillips today, the bosques on the Rio Chama Rio Grande are central to the Pueblo's way of life. Would this legislation allow Okiawinga to, as part of its water rights, begin the restoration of the Rio Chama of Oska in addition to expanding irrigation and drinking water access? Yes, it would. I appreciate that very much. Um, after this legislation becomes law, which I hope will happen during this Congress, I look forward to working with you in the years to come to restore the health of the river and the Bosque for the Pueblo and for all others in that community as well. 
Um, Mr. Crockett, I want to thank you as well for highlighting the importance of tribal co-stewardship in your testimony and some of the challenges that we're seeing today. Um, fires don't care what line exists or what fence is there. Um, we've seen the devastation from them. And if you've traveled to these communities, you've seen it. Um, the, the hardship that you see in, in families' eyes when you're talking to them, um, what you feel from them, when they've lost everything. And think about that one precious photo that you may have of a grandma or grandpa that, you know, we don't have it digitally maybe. It's the only thing we've got, but it tells a story and it's something that was passed on to us. It's gone. Investments in the health and resiliency of our forests not only reduce the risk of severe wildfires, they promote the important bonds that many tribes have to the land and to cultural resources. Now, President Padilla, why is it important to expand the TFPA authority to allow tribes to protect and restore their own forests and rangelands, and not just those on federal lands to protect against wildfires? I think it's important to kind of like cross the boundary as we're doing, you know, yes, it is important to, uh, we do want to do work on the Forest Service lands, the, you know, that are, are near our reservation, but it is helpful to do these as landscape scale treatments. So work on our side that's complementary to the work as, as we're going across the border. I think that's really important. That, that's the whole point is, is to create defensible space. And sometimes that, you know, I mean, it crosses the boundaries, just as everybody has mentioned here. You know, it is important to do treatments on both sides to really armor up those, those boundaries. I appreciate that. And in addition to that, Madam President and Vice Chair Murkowski, I am very appreciative of the kinds of maybe local small businesses that might launch from being yeah. able to go and manage more. Um, certainty for a small business, for someone that maybe owns a chainsaw and an old pickup right now, maybe they're going to be able to buy two or three, hire a few people, modernize that truck, get a trailer, be able to clear a little bit more and, and share and expand. And I just see the immense upside of this as well. So I thank all the panelists for their time. I thank the chair and the vice chair again for today's uh, hearing. Thank you. Vice Chair Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, and I thank uh, the Senator for that comment, and I, I wanted to direct this to, to you, Mr. Malat. You are intimately familiar with the, the TFPA and the forest management. You've been working it for many, many years at, at AFN to ensure that the Native communities um, um, uh, in Alaska and otherwise can, can utilize the TFPA. Um, so I think what, uh, what Senator Lujan has said is worth noting, is the economic opportunities that can be made uh, available, the social and economic benefits um, uh, if, if ANCSA lands are made eligible under TFPA. Can you just speak a little bit more to that, uh, what you might anticipate, as well as perhaps some of the, the environmental benefits uh, to federal forest lands in Alaska? You mentioned uh, what we're seeing with invasive species, the spruce bark beetle, um, uh, some of that and how that is impacting, uh, maybe not so much in the Tongass, but certainly up in, in the Chugach. Um, so if you can just speak to, to not only the social economic benefits, but the environmental benefits of, of being able to, uh, to do what we're proposing under this legislation. I'm going to excuse Murkowski for that, Mr. Murkowski for that question. Um, and I also want to echo Senator Lujan's uh, statement that you know this this bill does have opportunities for economic um, and also for expansion of our own capacity within our communities. Um, as I mentioned, you know, Sea Alaska has a really large silviculture program. They, you know, for them and for us as Clinkett people, cedar is a valuable tree for us. So if we could, you know, help co-management or you know enter in agreements with the Forest Service, help you know manage our you know, cedar groves and expand that you know their, their, that 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 that. That resource for us, um, we vital uh, for both our cultural and also economic um, in our communities because you know um, we're trying to you know if you look at Juno with the with all the, with all the new tonal poles going up, that, that's a cultural um, benefit for us. And of course, you know we protect our cedar trees. I um, also want to recognize that you know as you look at our communities, you know it, the economic ability and jobs in our communities are, are tough, right? So if our ANCs or landowners could you know, enter an agreement for service, even BLM up in the Doyon lands, Doyon has a lot of BLM lands up there. You know, our communities, um, 
want to manage our lands, and if we could enter agreements with our ANCs and our tribes to manage um, adjacent federal lands, um, it will give a, a lot, I mean, a lot, a lot um, um, opportunity for our communities to help to engage in that. So, you know, you could have local um, participation from our communities to engage with the fire boundary um, through adjacent BLM Forest Service to best lands. As you know, Sarah Kelsey, you could drive through, you know, hundreds of acres of land and you see spruce bark beetle kill everywhere. Um, and that's something that I think we need to address. Um, a couple years ago, my mom's hometown rampart was very close to being evacuated for, for a forest fire. And that's really, really stressful to watch that and hear a family go through that. And so ability for our communities, you know, even engage in you know, mitigation for that and, you know, even hire local, local help for that, that goes a long way. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, um, I think you can hear whether it's from Alaska and uh, our, our our lands up north to the lands as far south as, as New Mexico, uh, Arizona. This is an issue that uh, I think there is clearly common ground and we would like to work with our agencies to make sure that this partnership um, uh, really is meaningful um, to achieve not only the environmental benefits that we're seeking, but also the social and economic benefits. Thank you very much. If there are no uh, further questions for our witnesses, members may also submit follow-up written questions for the record. The hearing record will be open for two weeks, and I want to thank all of our witnesses for their time and their testimony today. Uh, Mr. Chairman, and just before we close, I want to acknowledge my committee intern, uh, Naishe Andrew. She's going to be completing her internship with us. She is uh, she is a Nupiak. She's Yupik. She's from Anchorage. She's attending college at Yale. She's been a, a great addition to us here on the committee. And um, uh, I want to thank her for her work and uh, for the participation. Thank you very much. And we appreciate her work as well. I want to thank everybody for being here. And this hearing is adjourned.